Hi everybody, we're going to discuss rates of change in this video. So first of all, I'm going to read you a little sentence and then we're going to talk about some different types of rates of change we're going to be needing in this course. So the concept of a limit, hopefully you watch the limit introduction video. If not, go back and watch that. The concept of a limit will help us distinguish how a function varies. Now I've put limit in quotations because we really haven't talked about how to define a limit, but I gave you an idea in the previous video. So for a small change in x, so if you just change your x value just a little tiny bit, will there be a small change in the function value? So if you move your x value just a little bit, will your y value change just a little bit? This is basic definition of con continuous. Or on the other hand, if you change your x just a little bit, will the values of your function jump? Will they vary erratically? Will they go all over the place? Um, big, small, negative, positive. Or is it your function going to tend to increase or decrease without bound? Will it go to infinity or negative infinity? Those are the kinds of questions that we're going to try and clarify using limits. But before we get there, our next topic is going to be to talk about the average speed. And we're going to try and get to what's called an instantaneous speed. So first, let's review. So this is not calculus right now. This is a review of basic, um, I guess, algebra. So scenario, suppose you're on a car trip from Daytona to Disney World. We all want to go to Disney World. Your parents are questioning how you arrived so fast. Uh-oh. So what speed will you tell them you traveled at? Now think about it. When you get in the car and you start driving, is there just one speed that you travel at? No. You get in the car, maybe you're on campus. So you get in your car and you start driving. Hopefully you're driving the speed limit on campus. What was that, 10 miles an hour? And then there's speed bumps, so you have to slow down even slower. And then um, you finally get out of campus and you're on the road and you travel 30 miles an hour because there's one little car that won't get out of your way and you're stuck behind them. And then, oh, they finally turn. You start traveling 45 miles per hour. And then you get on the interstate and you're traveling 70. Oh, nope. You have a lead foot. Maybe you're traveling 80. Please don't do that. So you get in the car and you start traveling. Oh, you got you weren't paying attention. You hit 90 miles an hour. You slow down. Okay, good. You slow down. Somebody cuts you off and you slam on the brakes. How many different speeds are you traveling on this one little tiny trip? Think about it. So your parents ask you what speed you were traveling at. What are you going to tell them? Well, obviously you can't tell them the 10 miles per hour that you're driving in the parking lot they won't believe you and you probably don't want to mention that you hit 90 because well you might lose your you know driving privileges <laughs> so what are you going to tell them? well the safest answer would be your average speed you're not telling them the fastest you're not telling them the slowest but you are telling them the truth if you provide them the average speed that you traveled at so that's what we're going to do here we are going to use the truth and we're going to use the average of your trip. All right. Now, do you recall how to calculate an average speed? Well, you don't want to have to sit down and calculate this time period I did this many miles per hour and then this time period I did this many miles per hour. You don't want to have to look at every single segment of your trip. That's not reasonable. Is there an easier way to calculate your average speed? Yes. Hopefully you remember from your past, the average speed is simply your total distance divided by your total time. Generally, this is referred to as distance divided by time. But I want to point out it is your total. It's the big picture of your travel, uh, the distance and the time. It's not just every single little individual piece. If you just look at the total distance and the total time and divide them, that's going to give you your average for your entire trip. Now, we have a way to denote this mathematically. So let me show you that right here. So using mathematical notation, we can describe this as follows. So this is a definition of average speed here. So let f of t represent the distance traveled at time t. So if you're 10 minutes into the trip, f will tell you how many miles you've traveled so far. So we're going to let we're going to have two t values. We're going to have t1 and t2. Those are the intervals of our trip. So t1 would be your initial time that you started your traveling and t2 is going to be your final time when you finished your traveling. So the average speed over this time interval, usually for us it's going to be 0 to however long you drove. Um so the average speed over this particular time interval is the distance traveled divided by the elapsed time. It's exactly what we just said. 
Mathematically, though, we have a way of writing it using this function notation. So when you want to talk about the distance traveled, you subtract your starting distance. So we're assuming this is like your lifetime, basically, maybe. Or maybe we're talking about a small part of a larger trip. So where did you start? Many times we're going to start at zero as our distance. And then this, so it's going to be zero or your starting point. And then f of t2 is going to be however far you went or your um, end point. So where you started versus where you end. And then on the bottom, it's your start time for T1 and your finish time for T2 or end. So notice it's kind of backwards. You take the end minus the beginning on the top and the bottom. It's very important that you have the order of these terms correct. If you switch up anything, you're going to either get the wrong sign. Um, well, actually, um, the order is very important, but if you switch everything completely, if you switch T1 and T2 everywhere, that part's okay. So I can, wherever there's a T2, I could put T1, and wherever there's T1, I could put T2. That'll give us the same answer. But um, generally, we write it in this fashion here because it makes more sense in terms of the signs of our answers. So the end minus the beginning is going to give you nicer signs to work with. If you mix up just the top or just the bottom, so if you get something backwards, if they don't line up exactly, you're going to get the wrong answer. So be very careful with that. All right, so that is what you probably have already heard of before. That's the average speed. So now I want to give you an example. So we're going to go back in history for a brief moment. And we're going to talk about Galileo. Hopefully you've heard that name before. So Galileo discovered that an object, a solid object, dropped from rest. So this term rest is going to be very important to you. So let me take a second to explain this. If an object is dropped from rest, that means it is released from a position where it's not moving. So if I'm holding an object and I just happen to let it go, that's an example of an object dropped from rest. Whereas if I take a ball and I try and throw it, that's not from rest. If I'm throwing the object, it has an initial velocity. So you'll probably hear more about that when you're in your physics class. But for our class, if you see something dropped from rest, this is a very specific case where there's no initial velocity. It's not being thrown. It doesn't have a force behind it. All right, so Galileo discovered that a solid object dropped from rest near the surface of the Earth. Why is it important to be near the surface of the Earth? What does the Earth have that we lose when we leave it? Ah, oh, maybe you're thinking gravity? Hopefully. All right, so when this object is uh, dropped and allowed to fall freely, will fall a distance proportional to the square of the time it has been falling. This type of motion is called free fall. So if you see a, in your homework something that says it's in a free fall, this is the scenario that we're talking about. All right, we are assuming here that we have a negligible air resistance to slow the object down. So it's not super rainy, uh, there's nothing in the way, so the air is not affecting the traveling of the object. And that gravity is the only force acting on the object. So there's no trees in the way, there's no motor, no engine pushing it, nothing like that. So in this scenario, just an object falling through uh, the sky, if y denotes the distance fallen in feet after t seconds, then Galileo's law is this one, y equals 16 t squared feet. So you plug in t, however much time you're interested in the object falling, and you'll find out how far it's fallen. Where 16 is the approximate constant of proportionality. If you want to learn about 16, hang in there. We're going to learn how to create this equation later. Uh, we're also, you're also probably going to see something like this in physics. But for now, just take me at my word. So 16 is an approximate constant of proportionality. All right, so an example I want to show you is an orange. So we're going to have an orange on a tree. It's going to, so it's at rest. It breaks loose from a tall orange tree. If it's not a tall orange tree, it's not interesting. What is its average speed during the first two seconds of fall? Hmm, let's think about that. Okay, so this, ob this orange is falling. First of all, we're going to assume it falls and there's no branches in the way. There's nothing affecting its travel. So just simplify it. There's one branch sticking way out and there's an orange falling. All right, well, what is its average speed? Well, to figure this out, we're going to need to know how fast, how far it's traveling in different times. Well, because this is just a free fall object, we're going to actually utilize the equation by Galileo. Y equals 16 T squared. Or you could call this F of T, a function if you want to use function notation, like our formula we had before. 
So during the first two seconds of fall, well, first two seconds, let's see, we need to find average speed. Well, if you go back to the formula we just looked at a second ago, here, I can do that right now. So here's our average speed formula. We need two times, the starting time and the ending time that we're interested in. So if we're talking about over the first two seconds, then we're talking from zero to two are our t values. So we need f of each of those values. We're going to subtract them, and we're going to subtract the times on the bottom. That's what we're going to do to solve this problem. All right, so our t1 is going to be zero, and our t2 is going to be two. So to find the average speed, we're going to plug this information into the formula, f of t2 minus f of t1 divided by, remember to keep your t's in the same order, so t2 over t2 and t1 over t1. All right, so f of t2, so t2 is going to be 2, so f of 2 minus f of 0 divided by 2 minus 0. All right, so f of 2. So here's our f function. Let's plug 2 in. So 16 times 2 squared. So 2 squared is 4 times 16. That would actually be 64 feet. So this means that the object traveled 64 feet uh, by the time it reached 2 seconds. Minus, well, this object was at rest. So at 0 time, we plug in 0. We find that it's traveled 0 feet because it was at rest. Over, we can work out the bottom. 2 minus 0 is 2. So 64 over 2 is 32. Now units on average speed is the units of the top and the units of the bottom. I like to look at the formula. It usually helps me. Remember, this top here, these are just distances in feet. So on top we have feet. On the bottom we have our time, which our time was in seconds. So feet per second. So the second part of our question asks us what happens during the one second interval between second one and second two. So the object starts dropping, the orange starts dropping. We don't care about the first second from zero to one. Who cares? What we want to focus in on is from second one to second two. So that's just one second alone. Before we looked from zero to two, so we looked at two seconds. So what's happening just in that second second that this is traveling? So let's do the same thing. We're going to find the average speed. Our T1 is going to now be one second, and our T2 is now going to be two seconds. We're not interested in the entire time the object is traveling. We're just interested in the shorter time period. So again, our formula, F of T2 minus F of T1 over T2 minus T1. It's still the same problem. We're still, still dealing with the same function. So 16T squared is our distance formula. All right, so we're looking at F of... 2 minus f of 1 over 2 minus 1. All I did was plug in our t1 and t2 values. Equals. So let's see, f of 2, we already did that one. That one was 64. Plugging it into the function. Now we plug 1 into the function. So 16 times 1 squared, that's 16 over 1. So 64 minus 16, that leaves us with 48. The units, again, are the distance divided by the time. So distance is in feet, time is in seconds. All right. I have a very important question for you now. We've worked out two different speed, average speeds here. We did the average speed over the first two seconds. For that one, we ended up with 32 feet per second. But if we just look at the second second, we ended up with 48 feet per second. What does this mean? Why are they different speeds? Well, just like when you were traveling in your car, we talked about the driving to Disney World, you aren't always traveling at the same speed. When an object falls in free fall, what does this say is happening? Well, over the first two seconds, our average is only 32 feet per second. But when we look at just the second second, our average is 48 feet per second. Hmm. Well... Remember, when you do an average, it's the entire uh, distance divided by time. So it appears that in the first two seconds of travel, in total, we're only traveling 32, and the second second, we're traveling 48. We're traveling faster. That's what this is trying to tell you. So the 32 says that we're traveling at an average 
over the first two seconds that is slower than if you just look at the second second by itself. If you were to do the math and look at just the first second, you would see that it's even slower than 32 feet per second because the average of the first two seconds is 32 and the second seconds included in that. So why are these values different? In free fall, the object is um, speeding up. Later on, we'll talk about this concept of speeding up as being the acceleration. It is accelerating. So that's your first example of average speed. Um, again, we still haven't gotten to calculus. We're going to work our way towards that. But first, we had to review the concept of average speed.